In today's show, we're going to be focusing on carbohydrates. We're going to bust some myths about whether they're good for us, whether they're bad for us. We're going to get some real good support from doctors too. Dr. Dan Mags will be joining us in about 10 minutes' time. Later in the show, we're going to go to the Trussell Trust to speak to Gary Lemon, uh, one of the organisers of the Trussell Trust, to see what we can do uh, to help our food banks across the country and get an update on our fundraising to see how it's going and what effect it's having. And then later in the show, we're going to hear from Poppy Hadkinson, who is a nutritionalist. And Poppy is going to talk on theme about carbohydrates. So the whole show is, what's carbohydrates about? How does it work? What happens when we eat them? And let's really go back to one, one I've, got a, I've got a whiteboard with me today. Oh, also, most of our kids are in the studio today. I've got Jack, uh, who's producing the show. I've got Tom, who's going to be looking at fundraising. I've got Jesse. I'm not sure what Jess is going to do in a bit. And Lily's just going to keep smiling and keeping me happy all the way through. Maybe a time checker uh, today. So there's my kids in the bunker with me, working on today's show. Got the whiteboard. We're going to be talking about carbohydrates. But first... Let's go to a guy called Gary Torbs, all the way over in America. Gary has written many, many books. He's actually not a doctor, but an investigative journalist. And he has uncovered the truth about the history that went wrong with food and why I was obese for 25 years, why even Dan Maggs, the doctor we're going to hear from in a bit, was overweight for a long time. Here's Gary Torbs to tell us where it all went wrong. So when I started this research 20 years ago, um, I'd say there were maybe a dozen physicians in the world prescribing these low-carb, high-fat diets. The technical term is ketogenic diets. Um, for a long time, they've been known as low-carb diets. For a while, they were known as high-protein diets. The terms keep changing, but the gist of it is you, you don't eat carbs because they're fattening. So you avoid the bread, pasta, potatoes, rice, the grains, the legumes, all fattening, and you eat a lot of fat and green vegetables, green leafy vegetables, because while they have carbs in them, the fiber and water content kind of dilutes all that out to the point that they're harmless. Thanks for that, Gary. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Now I can see uh, Dr. Dan Mags is already uh, joined us. Dan, how are you, my friend? I'm really good, thanks, Steve. Yeah, so uh, it's a bit today's... strange to be doing things like this really <laughs> over the uh, uh, live link like this, but uh, but great to be here, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. So let me just introduce you. So Dr. Dan is a GP. He's out there helping in the community on a daily basis, as all GPs are really working hard at the moment. We're so proud of our NHS. Uh, but Dan's got a great story. He also runs a website called carbdodging.com. He has hundreds of thousand people uh, watching him on YouTube and his videos where he teaches us how to eat more healthily and around ketosis, about uh, fasting and so on and so forth. But I hand you over to Dan now. I wanted to tell, if you can, Dan, tell your story and then tell us the truth about carbohydrates. Okay, Steve. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thanks for having me on. So, my story started about four or five years ago, uh, back in 2016. That was when I went through my uh, weight loss uh, journey. But take it back a few years before that, I've, I really struggled with my weight ever since I was a probably a teenager, to be honest. Snacking, uh, lucky enough to have school lunches, which were carbohydrates with a side of carbohydrates with. Uh, you know, dessert and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, and snacks at <laughs> break time and stuff and drinking, you know, sugary drinks, which I think was really where my weight loss started. Probably add that onto some sugar based cereal in the morning as well, <laughs> because that's what we did. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where my weight issue started and really gathered pace during my 20s. Um, add into that being a junior doctor, studying a lot, stressful times, rushing to get. Um, you know, food on your breaks and stuff like that from the hospital canteen, uh, just quick energy foods just to boost your energy and uh, not really having enough time to cook. And uh, and you turn up turn up in your early 30s as being uh, officially obese, uh, despite really having to, despite really trying everything, typical calorie restricted diets, you know, the kind of things, uh, trying to do plenty of exercise. Uh, as I know yourself, it didn't really work for you either, Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, really got pretty stuck into a, a cycle of dieting and 
building my weight back up again, uh, you know, pretty rapidly afterwards. And uh, uh, yeah, started snoring because of my weight issues and uh, generally feeling pretty rubbish. Uh, so things back in 20, uh, changed back in 2016 when I really discovered uh, low carb dieting. And that was, um, I had a really strange experience actually. I was skiing in France um, with a, a guy who was spooning butter into his coffee at breakfast time. And I was like, what on earth are you doing? This seems like a really, really strange thing to do. Uh, so I asked him uh, and he, you know, he wasn't a doctor. He was non-medical and he just explained to me this uh, uh, new way of thinking about obesity and being overweight. And that was that we should be... Um, we should be thinking about it as a um, hormonal problem rather than as a simple energy in and energy out kind of problem, okay? Uh, and I came back from that holiday, uh, put into practice what he'd been talking about, and six months later, I'd completely cured my obesity. I lost about nearly 30 kilograms in a six-month period, uh, maintained that ever since, and yeah, it's become a big passion for me because... As soon as I started questioning that kind of advice that we were giving out, uh, everything else started to tumble as well. So uh, uh, the low-fat guidelines, saturated fat, all this kind of stuff. So I'm now a big believer, yeah, especially for people who are struggling with their weight. Um, this doesn't necessarily seem to apply to everybody. A lot of people are you know, metabolically very healthy and can strangely seem to tolerate a lot of carbohydrates. Um, but for, especially for people who are struggling with their weight, um, Cutting the carbohydrates is especially important. Sugar uh, for everybody is, you know, irrespective of metabolic health, uh, sugar needs to be seen as something that is very, very bad for our health and should be minimized uh, and preferably eliminated from our diets. So yeah, that's my journey, Steve. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm so I'm a big believer in it. You know, uh, that's what I do over on my YouTube channel, as you've just said, uh, talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, especially at the moment with everything that's going on in the world, you know, I think it's really, really difficult because a lot of us are out, uh, you know, we're out of this mindset of, oh, you know, I need to lose some weight so I can look good, get the beach body ready for the summer, that kind of <laughs> stuff, Steve. Um, you know, and we're very much into survival mode. I mean, you know, we, we live in this, uh, for everybody watching this at home, myself and Steve live in the same town uh, and the supermarket that is pretty much between our, our houses is has been over the last few weeks pretty bare of stuff. OK, it's not being the most well stocked place. So I think a lot of us have switched that mindset away from um, uh, really thriving, trying to lose weight back to surviving. But I'm pleased to report that over the last few days, uh, the stocks, uh, people have reduced their panic buying. You realize that there is plenty of food out there for everybody. The supermarkets are doing a really great job. And, uh, you know, the, the stocks on the shelves are going to be restocked. And we're managing to get plenty of food in. Uh, I've been shopping yesterday morning. Very lucky to be able to be going on the NHS half hour that opens. So really, really lucky to be able to get food. But I think it is important that we develop. Uh, we do start thinking about our health in terms of what we're eating. You know, I hear from a lot of people who are, you know, they're at home all the time now, Steve. They're starting to snack a lot during the day because they've just got ready access to the kitchen and stuff. I am very worried about the amount of people that people are drinking at the moment because, you know, they, people are sitting at home and, you know, to, treating it a bit like a holiday and it you know that's a one good way to approach it mentally and stuff but but if you're drinking every night we're going to end up off the back of this with some re, some different set of prod, problems than we went into it with really but yeah i just want to encourage so that's a really good go point. Go that's a really good point there dan so really what we're trying to do with this program one hour every day is to try and help people learn about food because there's been so mm. much misinformation hasn't it over the years you just said you were a beast yourself and you were a doctor and that's because even doctors don't get trained nutrition is my understanding when you're at medical school and therefore we've got to re-educate the country about what good food looks like and seize maybe this opportunity right now where mcdonald's is closed where greg's is closed where subway is closed seize this opportunity and the restaurants are closed uh, i have a restaurant closed like everybody else's seize this moment say right we've got to change the way we eat let's not 
changed the way we eat and snack at home and drink excessive alcohol. It's changed the way we eat at home by learning about it. Because so, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the biggest problem with food in the UK is we just never taught it properly. And therefore, if we can, with your help and the other doctors coming on daily, re-educate what good food looks like, then maybe we actually turn this real negative into a little bit of positive for some people. They come out the other side, maybe lost some weight, maybe changed their metabolic syndrome, maybe reverse diabetes, maybe cut down obesity, maybe got their liver in a better state. It, it, it might be pie in the sky thinking, but could we seize this moment and maybe actually get the country healthy? Yeah, I mean, I think, Steve, uh, you know, if people are, um, you know, we have such access to a lot of easy junk food in life and a lot of that access has been taken away. You know, we, we are being encouraged that, uh, you know, in the UK, obviously the situation is uh, different around the world, but you know, we're encouraged in the UK that we should only go out for, to the supermarket and to do an essential shop. We shouldn't be popping. I mean, the shop near my house, the little shop is still open, but we shouldn't be popping over there for a chocolate bar at the moment. OK, we should be doing our big weekly shop, uh, uh, trying to minimize the amount we go out for the sake of everybody. And, and therefore, we shouldn't be snacking. And if as long as we are and I think that's a really good uh, thing. And I think, you know, if we are in that situation at home, uh, then we we're going to naturally have an improved diet over where we were before. OK, as long as you're not bringing a load of that junk food home from the supermarket, simply going back to, you know, three meals a day uh, and not snacking and stuff is going to bring the amount of sugar and processed food that you're uh, consuming down significantly. OK, so that's a great place to start. All right. If you can then move on from there, now is a great time to be practicing your kitchen skills a lot of people not everybody has got a lot of extra time on their hands at the moment so use that to develop your cooking skills and even that is going to start to to um uh to make a big change in your health if you've been previously been surviving on you know shop bought sandwiches and a lot of processed food simply switching it back to real food cooking at home is going to be a, a great next step. It's just also going to be a great time for parents who are homeschooling to be able to uh, educate their children about cooking, uh, educate their children about food. What a fantastic time to include this into the educational program at home. Uh, you know, something that schools uh, don't really, really teach, um, which is one of the basic life skills, in my opinion, Steve, is cooking. You know, it's been lost out of our, our educational system for, for, for many, many years now as it's just not considered a priority when it, you know, in my view, absolutely is a priority. So, yeah, absolutely great. So other ways to so stop the snacking at home is absolutely fantastic. If you can then go uh, one step further, a big thing is uh, that I'm really interested in is uh, fasting. You know, for those of us who are uh you know, are overweight or obese, and next great step is skipping breakfast. Or maybe, you know, because you're not defined oh, by the normal... Whoa, 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 whoa. let me stop with this. Skipping breakfast? Oh, isn't that the most important meal of the day? While I've just got the microphone for a second, uh, live on YouTube right now, while we've got Dr. Dan Mags with us, if you've anybody's got any questions, post them on YouTube. I'll keep my eye on it, and uh, we'll ask... Uh, those questions of Dan. But let's get back to that. Skipping breakfast, isn't that the most important meal of the day? Well, we're taught, we're taught this, aren't we, Steve? And I think it's a lot of... Uh, uh, sorry to go off the, the carbohydrate track a little bit. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, we're taught this, but is that due to the fact that marketing messages have been telling us that it's the most important meal of the day, okay? Um, one of the big things that I always teach is we should be eating when we're hungry. And what, per what better time to be exploring that with our own bodies at the moment when we're not defined by the normal working schedule oh, that we point. are defined at the moment. You That's know, if you are point. at home, try to try to be very conscious and mindful of when your body is telling you to be hungry and eat only when you're hungry at the moment okay and if you're then focusing on good home cooked food you're already going to be so far ahead in terms of health than you would have been uh you know before you know two or three weeks ago okay so yeah i think there are some really really good positives in here steve can definitely I, can i interject, interject there so Dan, what Dan is saying, and this is really, really important, I wrote it in my book, Fat and Furious, is that we were taught that 
breakfast is the most important meal of the day. That is not the case. If you, the longer you can fast, so you had your evening meal or late afternoon or whenever you had it, the longer you can stay in a fasted state, of course you break that fast with breakfast traditionally, that's, what, that's why it's called break the fast, but if, you can, if you're not hungry in the morning, just don't eat. And push and push and push that window back till you are hungry because the longer you fast, your body, my body, Dan's body is either in one of two modes. It's either in breaking down the food we've just eaten, that's you're metabolizing the food, or you're in repair mode. The body doesn't do it at the same time. So if we're trying to bolster our immune system at this particular point more than ever, one of the best things you can do is extend the gaps between, sp uh, between your feeding, and that's why snacking's not a good thing at the moment, to bolster your immune system, extend as much as you can between meals, longer fasting, more repair mode, less digesting mode, better immune system, better defense system. Is that a, a fair comment to make, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. And we don't just necessarily need to be doing that in the morning. I think it's really, really important. Something I'm certainly trying to encourage people to do at the moment is to stick to a routine, okay, in terms of, you know, getting to sleep at a reasonable time and, you know, get, uh, getting, your, getting up in the morning and trying to keep, for your own mental health, sticking to some sort of a routine. And, and actually, you know, therefore, you don't want to be necessarily eating last thing at night, eating, you know, if you're going to bed at 10 o'clock at night, just to pick a figure out of the air, you know, you want to be trying to get your meal in a bit earlier. So it's not only uh, it's not only about eating, um, you know, later in the morning. It's about extending that fasting window. Another way of doing it is to reduce the time. Try to leave three or four hours, if possible, between the time when you are uh, eating your final meal and going to bed uh, and, and try not to be snacking during that time. It's a great way of extending that fast out and um you know, your, your metabolism is going to thank you for it. Uh, let's go back. That's brilliant advice, Dan. Brilliant advice. Let's have a couple of last tips for you, and I'll see if we've got any questions for you while you're giving you a couple of tips here. What have you done then to cut down the carbohydrates? You admitted that you were an obese GP and all the problems that came with that, the snoring and so on and so forth. You look fantastic, by the way, now, mate. Um, and uh, I've actually sat in a jacuzzi with this man. He's got a <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is This is the goal we're all aiming for. Um, but <laughs> the, just give us a couple of tips of what you've done to cut down the carbohydrates. Okay, so um, carbohydrates in of themselves, yes, I know bread does taste really quite nice on its own, but generally carbohydrates, your pasta, your rice, your bread, uh, potatoes, they're there as bulk foods. They don't have a huge amount of flavor in of themselves, okay? They're just there to bulk it up. They take off the, the flavor from everything else. Take simple spaghetti bolognese, for example, Steve, okay? The flavor from there is in the bolognese sauce and it's in the, the parmesan cheese that you're putting on top of it. It's not in the spaghetti. The spaghetti might be kind of fun, uh, thinking Lady of the Tramp and all that, but it's not actually that useful in terms of uh, adding any flavor in there, okay? So forget the spaghetti, okay? What can you have instead of spaghetti? You can have, um, uh, you, you could ha just have, you could, if you really wanted to just switch it out, you can use spiralized courgettes, okay? That's a really great way. Zucchini for anybody who's watching outside of the UK, uh, spiralized uh, courgettes or spiralized zucchini. Great way to start thinking about a switch. But also, what about just having some vegetables with your bolognese sauce? And, you know, it's a great, easy meal to be cooking. And you can cook it up at, and have a few days in the fridge as well at the moment. So it's an absolutely great starting recipe. Uh, and switching it out with just pouring that bolognese sauce over some fresh uh, vegetables. Uh, just such an easy way to get started, Steve. So I like that. Uh uh, courgette, as you call it. Uh, yeah. You, you can buy or zoodles. Or zoodles, yeah. If you haven't got yeah. a spiralizer at home, they're not expensive. If you can get one, great. If not, most supermarkets already, you can buy the uh, courgette already cut to look like spaghetti. Uh, also, we'll talk about cauliflower rice another day. Also, just put it on a bed of spinach. Now, a couple of questions for you, Dan, before you go. Nick says, yep. uh, Dan, so if I don't eat carbs, will I be tired all of the time? Where do I get my energy from? Okay, so absolutely great question, Nick. Yeah, so um, no, absolutely not. So there can be a bit of an adjustment phase if your body is completely all and you've been running on carbohydrates your entire life. 
then there can be a bit of an adjustment phase where you can feel a little bit fatigued. That is absolutely true. However, uh, that quickly passes within you know a week or sometimes two weeks if people really, really uh, are struggling. But no, your body then turns to your fat stores and your fat stores are essentially, without going too much into the science of it, because that's not what we're doing today, um, your fat stores are essentially being locked away by this uh, food uh, by, by the carbohydrates. Uh, so, so your body is preferring to uh, consume, consume those. But when you get used to it, you're getting your energy from your fat stores. And fat is a fantastic source of energy for the body. That's a great. So the way I put it, it's black and white. Your body is either a fat burning machine or a sugar stroke carbohydrate burning machine. They're the same thing. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's one or the other. If you are overweight and want to lose weight, first thing is you can never lose weight. There is no such thing as losing weight. You have to burn that energy. Excess body fat, especially around the midriff, is bought forward energy. They're like granola bars or cornflakes that you've paid for already there as energy. You just don't know how to access it because you are currently a carbohydrate machine. If you're eating sandwiches, pasta, rice daily, you're a carb burning machine. You can't even access that body weight at all because you're not training your body to do it. You have to cut down the carbs turn yourself to a fat burning machine, then the day, Nick, Nick asked the question, the day that you don't have any incoming energy or you've gone that super long fast, your body goes, ding, ding, I know how to access my fat stores because now I'm a fat burning machine. Mm. And that's what we're trying to get into. Right, next question comes from uh, Hannah. Dan, any advice for someone who feels a lack of strength when I cut out carbs completely in the gym? Yeah, so that can be a... Um that can be, a, again, that's another transitional process. And there's been a lot of studies around this, okay? Um, yeah, if you are completely cutting out carbs, then uh, certainly you might, if you're a, like a competitive athlete, um, uh, then you may struggle with, you know, achieving your top lifts and things like that in terms of your strength training for a, a while. Uh, a lot of people, endurance athletes, are using uh, low-carb diets for, uh, improving their uh, long-term endurance. It's very, very effective. And a lot of the athletes who would have been winning competitions in the longer distance results at the Olympics, if it wasn't cancelled, would probably be doing so uh, based off their fat stores. Okay, But yeah, you can certainly see a temporary dip in your performance. And for the majority of, um, you know, uh, kind of amateur level athletes uh, like myself who does uh, do CrossFit and uh, other strength training, that is absolutely fine for me. Uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not talking about giving out peak performance advice here for specific uh, athletic goals. Yeah, you're not saying uh, if you're trying to general health. You're not saying if you're trying to win the gold medal at the Olympics, that might be different. Uh, Professor Tim yeah. Noakes uh, did some research in South Africa. He's coming on the show. Uh, later in the week. He did some research. They took a massive survey of people running the 10K. Some were mm. carbohydrate loading, like you always were taught, like I was taught when I was doing marathons, carb yeah. load, carb, carb, carb. I used to run marathons. That's why I've got rubbish knees. When I was a beast, because I, uh, anyway, let's not go there. Uh, he did this experiment. Half of the group were people that ate carbs, carbs loading, like they thought you used to. Half were sort of meat adapted or fat adapted, and therefore they were eating no carbs. And there was no effect on performance, whether you were carb loading or whether you were somebody that was avoiding the carbohydrates. Uh, yeah. So that's the couple of questions for you. Thanks, Dan. Can we have you back on the show maybe later in the of week? Because that, that was fascinating. Yeah, no problem, Steve. Well, keep that NH, keep contributing to the NHS. I know you're doing a great, yep. great job. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Hopefully Thanks, sooner Steve. in the real world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just hopefully. Just virtual, my hopefully. friend. So let's hopefully we get over this as quick as we can. Definitely. Take care, Steve. Thanks, bye bye. Dan. That was the uh, incredible Dan Mags. Remember, this show uh, is all about educating you at home to help you learn more and more and more about food. And we're trying to raise money uh, for the food banks across the UK because right now they're under a certain, well, huge amount of stress. Why is that? Well, just imagine this. You're running and rushing in and out of the supermarkets. Less people at the moment taking the time to donate the food like they used to. Uh, and, and you can understand that. That's totally understandable. But we need you to carry on giving your food. Also, the volunteers in the food bank distribution centres and then face-to-face uh, -face with people that need those donations. Obviously, social distancing has meant that we can't, some of those food banks at the moment aren't operating like they used to. It means home deliveries and so on. And around 2% of UK homes rely on donations from 
the food banks. So in about five minutes' time, we're going to go and hear from uh, Gary uh, Lemon at the Trussell Trust, who run 1,200 of the food banks. But before we do, I'm going to go to the whiteboard in a minute. So if one of my children, just say hello to my kids, everybody, because they're obviously going to be doing their schoolwork in a, in a little moment, but at the moment they're helping produce the show. Um, but if one of you can turn camera three around, I just want to do some real basic understanding of food and carbohydrates and what that means to us. Um, because, right, there we go, spin it right round, so I'm all the way round, all the way round. Good lad, point it over this way. How does that look? Are we, are we in vision? We're in vision. Okay, so here's the thing. All food that you and I eat breaks down into three main sort of groups, yeah? Put on one side vitamins and minerals, because they're like that tip of the iceberg that we really need, that are the 1%, but let's say for now, 99% of all the food you're ever going to eat either breaks down into something called carbohydrates, and we call them carbs. Why do we call them carbs? Carbs are really bad sugars, right? Carbs, they either break down to fat, and this is really simplifying it, by the way, because we can then talk about fatty acids, uh, or they break into protein. Uh, I am dyslexic, so if there are any spelling mistakes, please forgive me. Is that spelled right, guys, protein, kids? It is. Excellent. Uh, Daddy spelt it right. Yes? Yes, spelt right. So all the food you eat breaks down into carbs, fat, or protein. Carbs, when they broke da break down the body, 100% turn into sugar. Now, there's a whole scale called the GI index and the GL load and all these things are all complicated and fantastic in one sense, but it's just about how quickly they turn into sugar to, to tell us how bad they are for us. If you don't burn carbohydrates, in other words, if you had loads coming in and you don't burn it straight away, the body stores it as glycogen and eventually pushes it to your fat stores. You can't have sugar in your bloodstream too much because too much sugar in your bloodstream is poisonous. So the body gets rid of it and stores it as body fat. Now, fat is different. Fat carries along with it lots of vitamins, lots of minerals often, and fat as long as it's normal, natural fat. And this whole thing about saturated fat against unsaturated fat, Total nonsense. You don't need to learn any of that whatsoever. Doesn't matter whether it's polyunsaturated, doesn't matter whether it's unsaturated, unsaturated, doesn't matter if it's saturated fat. That is not the problem. We'll explain this in all the coming shows. The only thing you need to know about fat, is it real fat or is it fake fat? Okay? Fake fat kills. Real fat is good for us, right? Fake fat, you've really got to be careful of things like vegetable oil. By the way, Jack, I can still hear uh, Dan in my microphone, um, in my headset. Um, fake fat, like vegetable oils, which isn't made of vegetables at all, which is a, became a big shock to me because that's what I used to cook in. You need olive oil, you need coconut oil, you need flaxseed oil, you need avocado oil, you need butter. Even ghee, yeah, is much, much more healthy than vegetable oil. So, but as long as fat is real fat, coming from real food, it's good for us. Protein is the building block of life. We need protein. Without that, we don't protect our muscles, the brain. Protein is the building block of life. Now, here is where we've got it wrong in the westernized world for the last 50 years. In nature, if what you're eating once had a face on it, or it's derived from something that once had a face on it, it is only made of two things, which is fat and protein. If it had a face on it, well, there you go, a fish, a sheep, a pig, it's made of just fat and protein, right? If what you're uh, eating was once a flower or a bush or fruit, it is predominantly just carbohydrates and, sorry, carbohydrates and protein. In nature, we don't get fat and carbs together. They don't exist together. It does not happen in nature. Um, there are a few exceptions, and those exceptions are milk, because of course, what is milk really for? It's for infants. Yes, we don't want those two together. Uh, and nuts. And why do we have nuts? Well, squirrels put them away to get through the winter. So other than where they're designed to make us put on weight, you don't get carbs and fat in nature. But where have we got it for the last 50 years? I'll tell you right now. For the last 50 years, packaged food is mainly made up of carbs and fat together. And carbs and fat together, and there is experiment after experiment after research, and sadly with mice that I endorse testing on animals, but the research is there, so I'm going to tell you. 
Every time you put these together, it ends up on the waistline. That is why people in remote places in the world, I've just been up in the Himalayas, uh, can have a complete carb-loaded meal on its own. But as long as it's just the carbs, get away with it. That's why you can eat lots and lots of fat on its own and get away with it. But mix the two together, we put on weight. Carbs, though, are the bad, bad guy, mainly because they are poisonous in the body if they're in the bloodstream. That's why we try to minimise the amount of glucose in the bloodstream. Just enough for energy, too much, the body releases insulin, puts it in our fat stores. Right, uh, I'm going to jump back on the desk. Uh, in a moment, we are going to be joined um, by uh, Gary Lemon. Now, Gary Lemon, if we can cut to camera one or camera two, Jack, there we go. <laughs> Gary is from the Trussell Trust. The Trussell Trust, they uh, operate over 1,200 food banks uh, in the UK. They're an amazing, amazing organisation. And uh, at the moment, what they need is our help. They need our help in the sense of putting food into the food boxes in our supermarkets. They need our help in raising funds to keep the operation going. They've had some big donations recently from ASDA, which they're very, very grateful for. And singer Liam Payne has just made a huge donation to the Trussell Trust. So, uh, anything you can do to help would be great. Have we got Gary Lemon on the phone yet? Gary, how are you? Hello, good morning. Hey, great to have you with us. Tell us about more about the trust and tell us more about what we can help. You know, I just find it terrible that we, we have people that, that you know, on, on our own doorsteps that you know, still need food support. What can, what can we do to help? Thank you, and, and just to say thank you to you and to all of your viewers for the incredible support that you've sh shown so far, and it, it's thank really, you. really necessary. And when um, the scale of the coronavirus crisis was beginning to uh, become clearer to us, we went out to food banks in the Trust of Trust network, and we asked them, listen, what should we do in the face of this? And they came back to us, and they were really, really clear. They said that they wanted to do what they've been doing for the past 10 years, and that was help the people that needed it most in their communities. And in fact, they saw that their job was all the more important under the current conditions. So they've been absolutely heroic. Over the past two or three weeks, you were talking about some of the challenges that we face in terms of uh, our volunteer base is older, so uh, we're dealing with that, um, trying to find supplies of food, um, donations, um, working under pandemic conditions and social distancing conditions and um, the food banks in our network and indeed independent food banks as well have been running at all of those challenges at the same time head on. Um, it's been incredibly inspiring to see them try to um, meet these challenges and at the same time it's been really inspiring to see the public support that we've had. Um, you mentioned the support we have from Asda and from Liam Payne, um, just from ordinary members of the public as well. We've seen enormous support and I think that you know if we as a nation are to get through this that is exactly the sort of community spirit that we all need to show so just an enormous thanks to everybody who supported us thus far um, it, this is going to be a challenge we're going to need more to get through this and just explain to everybody a little bit about how the donation I think obviously we're trying to raise the money through just giving and the text that we do but just if you can Gary just explain the actual donating the food bit because that's something that most people, you know, as they're doing that quick, quick shop around the supermarket, yep. we just heard from Dr. Dan Mags that said, try and do your big shop in one go, so you're doing less visits to the supermarket. But as they're going around thinking about their own food that they're going to start cooking from home more now, what should they be grabbing off the shelves and where can they find the donation box? So the way it works is very local and community based. So anything that you pop in the collection point in your local supermarket, it will be gathered for a period of time and then volunteers from the local food bank will come and take that and then they will go and um, take it back to kind of a central warehouse for the food bank and they will sort it um, into packages um, where we do our best to ensure that um, everybody gets a good balanced um, diet and amount of food out of those out of those packages um, and um, what we're asking the public to do is to find out exactly what it is that your local food bank needs. Because we try to give balanced packages, it means that food banks can run out of certain items. So it's actually often things that people don't expect. So 
I think what a, lot, what a lot of people think when it comes to donating to a food bank is tin of beans, and that's obviously very generous. But actually, it's often things like tin meat or tin fish or UHT milk uh, yeah. that uh, food banks run out of. So um, we would ask that you go to trustletrust.org, that's our website, and there's um, a page on there right on the front page where you can click through to, and you can find your local food bank and find out exactly what items it is that they're short of. It's really, really important that food banks get the, the, the right sort of food they need so that they can put together those balanced nutritional packages for people. That's great. That's really, really brilliant. So thanks for all your hard work, Gary. Can you come and join us back on the show maybe later in the week or next week and give us an update of where we're at, how the donations are going, um, and any more maybe specific needs? Because this is moving so quickly that I'm sure yes. things may change. Yeah, that would be absolutely my pleasure. And, and thanks again to you and your viewers. No, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's our pleasure. Anything we can do to help. I, was, I, I must admit, I had no idea how many people needed your support in the UK uh, till you reached out to us. And, and it, you know, we've, we've worked with our charity, the Colourful Life Foundation in Africa for years, where it's obvious to see the need, same in South Africa, same in India, but to have it on our own doorstep in yeah. what was supposed to be a really, I don't know what the word is, but you know, modern society, you know, and I, and I loved uh, Emma, your CEO, uh, what, when she said to me the other day, eventually we ideally want to put ourselves out of business, but yeah. while there's a need, let's together uh, put yourself out of business because obviously we want to get rid of hunger in the UK. But while we've got hunger in the UK, you guys are doing a fantastic, fantastic job. And um, we we'll look forward to speaking to you later in the week. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. So that was Gary Lemon from the Trussell Trust. They need our support in the supermarkets, dropping off the cans of veg, the cans of meat, the cans of fish. At the moment, they're asking for things like, and somebody said to me the other day, Steve, how are you backing a charity that actually says and give us your pasta and give us your rice the point is this there is a difference between optimal nutrition for you and I if we're not undernourished but if you are undernourished sometimes especially if you're malnourished sometimes the very things we tell you not to eat if you're trying to lose weight or get metabolically healthy are the very things that will quickly help you put on weight so for example our charity out uh, in Tanzania, we work with a massive community that have got AIDS. Now, when you get AIDS, you lose your appetite. And the first thing we have to do uh, in Arusha uh, and Moshi, the two areas we work with in Tanzania, the first thing we have to do is to get their weight back on. And what do we do that with? We do that with giving them nutritional flour. The very thing that I recommend you and I shouldn't have if, we're, if we are trying to lose our weight or get metabolically healthy. So while you might think there is a conflict with the things that we're saying that the Trussell Trust need, like the pastas, like the rice, there isn't a conflict because when you are malnutrition, mal under nutrition, I can never say the word, malnourished is the word I'm looking for, uh, then uh, that is, um, that, that's what uh, we need to do. Right, uh, just a question came in from Elliot. What foods are good for fighting off COVID? Well, we'll probably put that to our nutritionist Poppy that's coming through in a moment. But what Dr. Seema Lotra taught us yesterday was that what you want to do is keep your social distancing, wash your hands, those are the things we all know about, but then anything that can boost the immune system. So what boosts the immune system? What we call nutritionally dense foods. So you want to eat foods that are full of vitamins. You want to eat foods that are full of minerals. And there are 13 vitamins that we're recommended by the European Food Standard Agency that we need to consume daily. There are 14 minerals, so in total, 27 across the vitamins and minerals that we need to make sure are in our diet. They don't come from carbohydrates. Yeah? Carbohydrates, carbohydrates are very low and sometimes zero in nutrition. So your bread, your, your rice, your pasta, your potatoes, they are not nutritionally dense at all. The nutrition comes from the vegetables, comes from the meat, comes from certain fruits, not all fruits, but certain fruits. In fact, what I haven't done yet is today's challenge and it's 20 to 10. Uh, every day we're going to set you a challenge. We'd love to have your interaction right now, if we can, uh, on uh, YouTube or wherever you're watching the programme. Let's have your questions come in. Here is the guess. When you buy a McDonald's burger, just the bread, the bun, that's carbohydrates, yeah? It's not fat, it's not protein, it's just carbohydrates. The meat actually is probably the best bit of the whole thing in the middle. Just the bun, when you consume that, 
how much sugar does the bun itself turn into inside the system? Is it the equivalent of, say, one cube of sugar, two, three, four, or even more? That's the question. Come online, let us know, and we will reveal towards the end of the show how much sugar, as long as my children remind me, because I've got a terrible memory, <laughs> getting old, as long as they remind me, um, what is the amount of sugar just the bun turns into uh, inside a McDonald's burger? And yesterday we revealed how much sugar in a 15, uh, sorry, 12 inch Subway. In a 12 inch Subway, you were shocked yesterday, weren't you? The bread alone, the carbohydrates, turns into inside the body the equivalent of 15 cubes of sugar. Now go figure that out. That means the effect on the bloodstream is the same as eating. Just 15 cubes of sugar, the effect on your bloodstream, and remember sugar in the blood is poisonous, therefore you either use it for energy or it stores it as body fat. It's never the filling or rarely the filling inside a Subway that's dangerous. It's just the bread itself. If we're trying to lose weight, if we have diabetes, if we've suffered from cancer, if we're worried about heart disease, if we have fatty liver disease, any of those, we need, they're all linked through something called metabolic syndrome. We have to cut down the carbohydrates. Do we have Poppy available on the show? Right, uh, we're gonna go now and speak to uh, Poppy Hadkinson. Poppy is a trained nutritionist. Poppy, tell us all about yourself and carbohydrates. Hello, well, thank you so much for having me on, first of all. Uh, so. Uh, I'm a an accredited nutritional therapist. Uh, the role of a nutritional therapist is to identify uh, nutritional nutritional deficiencies. So we believe in the power of food. Uh, food is amazing, but can also uh, be negative if uh, you don't choose and eat the right foods. You know, it's the, it's the fuel for our body, and what we put into our body has an internal and an external effect on us. The way we feel, but also the way we look as well. So we look at what we're consuming in terms of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and encourage people to eat uh, what's called nutrient-dense food. And something that isn't nutrient-dense uh, is the likes of refined carbohydrates, for example, the, uh, the beige foods, if you like. Uh, so Dr. Dan uh, explained it you know, beautifully earlier. You know, these are, they're, they're pretty tasteless foods all in all. They're there to fill. Um, they're not. They're there to they're make you fat. Yeah, they're there to fill them. <laughs> yeah, they, they're fillers. They, they, they are fattening. They. The thing with refined carbohydrates is they break down into um, glucose, and glucose then has an effect on our blood sugars. Um, we believe in colourful, bright, nutrient dense foods. You know, lots of vitamins, lots of minerals that that help us feel. Uh, healthier and, and happier. And the the reason that I got into health uh, was actually as a result of my own in ill health, as Steve, you'll, you'll know already. Uh, so I suffered greatly over the years and I, and I still have it, but it's very well under control now with uh, severe asthma. Now, it's an interesting one, this, because this is a hot topic at the moment, uh, particularly with, with everything that's going on and understanding, you know, how... Uh, how, how a respiratory issue can, can cause so many problems. But uh, severe asthma is becoming more and more recognized. There's still a long way to go, in my opinion, a long way to go, because something that I hear people say so often, and it's so frustrating, is it's just asthma. I, I, that saying, it's just asthma. And you feel like going, it's just, what, it's just breathing. So um, I was actually at a, at a parliamentary reception. I went down to London to Parliament back in February and I spoke alongside uh, the MP, Jim Shannon. Um, I met our local MP here uh, from, from the Warwickshire area and Adeem Zahawi as well to talk about asthma, um, how severe it can be. And, and yeah, I, I work as an asthma advocate as well. Helping so anybody. Just, I, yes. I, hear, I hear you had it so severe that you effectively have died three times. Uh, so, <laughs> so I, I have been on a ventilator, a, a life support, four times. Yes, I've been in an induced coma. Uh, the longest uh, was a week. Um, that was ah. back in 2013. Actually, not not too far uh, far away from the time that we're in now. So it was across Mother's Day. I did it twice on Mother's Day. Uh, Steve, I know. Talk about a terrible Mother's Day gift. Uh, so yeah, feeling a lot happier, healthy now. But that's what made me want to take some control. So I think modern medicine is 
amazing it, it still to this day you know keeps me where i am you know uh, but there is a lot that we can do naturally and and food is the resource that we can look at to help us you know be the best versions of, of ourselves and understanding what's good for us and understanding what's bad for us as well so with the fast food chains closed at the moment Crikey, yes. if I could have found a way of doing that before without a virus, <laughs> I would have been right there. Um, so the fast food chains that have been poisoning my children for years and that I used to think were really healthy are, are gone at the moment. The restaurants, including my own, closed down. Um, so that means we have to, we, well, we've got no choice. We're all eating at home now. So let's give us some advice to everybody that's watching. What, what simple changes could they make to cut down the carbohydrates. So if people are used to always having the pasta, the rice, the yes. potatoes, I used to think jacket potatoes were really healthy. You wait, that's tomorrow's guess the amount of sugar mm -hmm. in, a, in a food type. Um, so if we're telling people that cut down on the bland carbs, the potatoes, the rice, the pasta, the bread, they're the main four to cut down on, and the cereals, cereals, oh, don't get me on. Let's, say, let's make it five, cereals, <laughs> bread, pasta, yeah rice and whatever the other one is off death forgot uh potatoes uh, if we're going to cut those five down give us some alternatives poppy please fantastic oh my goodness i would love to okay so this is a really really fantastic time for us to experiment with healthy foods um lots of pictures i've seen online of of, of those of us uh making amazing recipes with fresh fruits and vegetables you know particularly vegetables got to be careful with how many fruits we have because of the sugars but fruits are still amazing of course so um an alternative to uh, say noodles now you can get the the likes of or you can or you can make rather courgette spaghettis uh you know spiralize your vegetables and, and make that the base uh, of, of that spaghetti meal you can also get really fantastic alternatives um such as glucomannan uh noodles now, glucomannan, I love that word, by the way. I love the word glucomannan. Glucomannan, it's, it's a fiber. So you can get noodles that are made out of fiber rather than that of uh, fiber, uh, rather than that, uh, sorry, flour and grain. Coconut flour is a fantastic one to make recipes with as well. Um, cauliflower rice, love that as an alternative. Um, I've had, you know, a really spicy chili con carne, uh, getting the metabolism going with that of cauliflower rice, so rich in vitamins. So cauliflowers, um, you've got lots of vitamin C, vitamin K as well. So those immunity boosting, overall health and well-being, vitamins and antioxidants. Uh, the, 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 the thing is, Steve, these are the sort of foods that fill us up actually more than that of refined carbohydrates. Carbohydrates cause what's known as um, the carb crash. So you, you sort of you go up, you, you get this sugar rush. It's like giving a child sweets, you know, it's, it's the equivalent almost. And then before you know it, um, you come crashing back down twice as hard, feeling lethargic, and guess what? Craving even more carbohydrates. So it's the carbo coaster, you go like yeah. this. Agreed. So you want sustainable food sources that are nutrient dense, vitamin rich, that make you feel fuller for longer. You'll, you'll feel good, you'll look good. Um, and, and, and once you've got off that coaster, the carbo coaster, it becomes so easy. It really does. Yeah, there's a, a book that there's lots of great cookbooks. In fact, uh, later in the week, uh, the number one selling book in the UK at the moment uh, is by the Caldices. It's a cookbook. It's a low carb cookbook. Number one selling book on Amazon at the moment, or it certainly was last week. Uh, my own cookbook that I wrote with uh, Hannah Anderson called Primal Gourmet. Believe it or not, you can even make pizza bases without the carbohydrates. You just take flour, you just, not flour, but almond flour. Mm -hmm. Almond flour is healthy, it's nutritional, it's not carbohydrates. You take almond flour, you take some cheese, you throw in some eggs, you can make a pizza base that is truly healthy, truly delicious. delicious. We'll make sure that's on the Primal Living website for free later today because any or anything that where you normally would go for the pasta, the rice, the potatoes, the cereals, there is a much healthier way of cooking and eating. Now, before you go, Poppy, we have some yeah. questions that have come in uh, on YouTube. I think that's where most people are sending the questions. Uh, Poppy, uh, what tips would you give uh, us if we do suffer from asthma, says Nick? Oh, fantastic. Okay, so um, 
asthma sufferers uh, particularly are, are wanting to know what to do right now. Uh, so shielding is something that we're being asked to do as asthmatics, and that's the, the 12 week isolation period. So, so basically keeping yourself safe, uh, practicing social distancing, as we all know, uh, but particularly for asthmatics, make sure you've got your inhalers close by. Uh, you know, it, and, and keep up with your preventer inhalers as well. Don't start, you know, slacking on any of the, uh, uh, the, the, the routine of which you typically have. Um, stay in contact with your health professionals. Uh, keep your stress levels low. Uh, keep your immunity high because stress uh, is often a trigger. Um, the pollen's also up at the moment. We're starting to move into those months. Um, so if you have, you know, uh, allergy tablets, keep on top of those. But yeah, stress stress levels low, immunity. And, and this is, as I say, coming back to food again, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, eating foods that that keep us as healthy and, and happy and, and, and as immune, you know, keep our immune as high as possible is only beneficial for, it's, it's beneficial for all of us. But as asthmatics, you know, a cough, a cold, anything like that can really trigger us. So, uh, you know, keep up the healthy eating as well. Now, before we go to uh, one more question off YouTube, children, my children over there, any questions for Poppy? Well, you kind of throw us on the spot there. Well, can, yeah. can, we, uh, can, we, can we see you on the camera, guys? Let's see you. Uh, we're coming. We're coming, we're coming. So uh, we have got a few more on the web, and we are going to reveal how much sugar in a moment is in just the bun of a McDonald's every day. We're going to take a, a, an item of stable sort of food that you may be shopping for at the moment every day. We're going to reveal what the doctors, look at that, three-way conversation. That's real <laughs> good technology. So kids, any question for Poppy about what turns into sugar or what you should be eating right now? Um, well. They're not normally this shy. I'm a bit annoyed because someone's asked my questions on the YouTube because I was very interested as to what Poppy's favorite recipe was from your book, but I'll let someone else ask that. Um, Oh, I can, yeah, I can tell you what that is in a heartbeat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, kids, any questions? I've never known them. So how, how long has she, how long have you um, stopped eating carbs for that? Question if you didn't hear that, Poppy, how long has it been since you've been eating carbs? I haven't been, you know, that's a really interesting question because as, so as a trained nutritional therapist, you, you actually get taught a lot of the conventional um, information. So there, there is actually a section that talks a great deal about carbohydrates much like that of the eat well plate. Um, oh, the, oh, 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 uh, one of the charities that we have, well not for charity, but a not-for-profit, is called healthdaddy.com, where we're lobbying government, including Tom Watson and all the doctors, Dr. Seema Lotra, Dr. David Unwin, and so many more. We're lobbying government to get rid of this, because this is the current guidelines yeah. to what good food looks like, and it is nothing but fake news. It is fraudulent. It is killing people left, right, and centre, and we have to get it changed. Uh, but I cut you off there. Uh, you were saying something about the, uh, the, the eat well plate. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's, I, I mean, I, I can feel your passion, Steve. And obviously, we're very much, you know, on the same team here of trying to educate and, and bring forward the, the, the fact that actually there is, there is the likes of sugar and bread and pasta on that, um, that eat well guide. And actually, I'll, I'll go back onto the food banks in just a moment, if that's okay as well. Uh, but my, I saw my, my nutritional therapist course I did a number of years ago, but, but actually understanding the primal side of things um, and, and lowering the carbs, that's been, gosh, it's been almost five years now, four or five years that's been. Um, but on the note of food banks, because I know a lot of people um, have even contacted me and said, look, there's, you know, and, and you touched on it upon, uh, upon this earlier, Steve, there's bread, there, there's pasta, there's, there's a number of different uh, foods on there, which perhaps you wouldn't necessarily, well, we, you know, we, we talk about not having. Um, first and foremost, if you're malnourished, by the way, there is a difference between malnourished and hungry. Um, but if you're malnourished, if you haven't got the nutrition, uh, then, then of course you just need you need food. That is the, of the most important factor there. So of course, we, we, you know, those that need food the most, they're malnourished. Let's let's get them the food. Um, but there are some healthier options that you can give to food banks. So you know, think about your tinned fish. 
uh, tinned meats. Nuts are a great one. They're so um, nutrient dense, you know, full of healthy fats. Yes, we love our healthy fats. Uh, so there are a few alternatives that you can get in there. Glucomannan, the fiber noodles, uh, as referenced as well. Uh, so yeah, it's it's where you can uh, offer out the healthier options. But but thank you to to everybody as well that's been donating. Um, you know, it, it, the Just Giving page. Um, it's much appreciated. But yeah, it's most important that those that need it just get food. But if we can give the healthier options, let's do that as well. Malotra, eat real foods. It's as simple as that. Eat real foods. Eat foods that are rich in nutrition, rich in vitamins, rich in minerals. That is your fish, your meat, your green leafy vegetables and some fruits, especially the berries and strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. Those sorts of fruits are really, really, really healthy. If you're trying to lose weight, if you've got any metabolic problems, not too many oranges because they're full of sugar. You know, people think you've got to have oranges for vitamin C. No, you don't. One bell pepper, a yellow bell pepper, has five times more vitamin C than one orange. So there's lots and lots of ways to get vitamin C in your diet without oranges. So the berries are good. Natural Greek yogurts are really good. Salmon and eggs, eggs, eggs are amazing. Avocados are amazing. Absolutely incredible. Uh, right, a few more questions. Uh, Jewel says, is there any safe additive to wean oneself off sugar in tea? I'm cutting down but can't completely stop tea uh, without sugar. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we recommend something called Stevia. We don't like artificial sweeteners because we think artificial sweeteners weaken the immune system and certainly if they don't weaken the immune system they may be damaging our microbiome there's no research to back that up that is just a lot of uh, sort of data out there but no not actually scientifically back yet but that's what we all believe if that kind of makes sense uh, sugar obviously is a no-no so something called stevia or stevia as they say in america stevia is from the leaf of a plant it's a natural sugar replacement that's the one uh, we recommend if you can't um, do your tea without sugar. But what I would say is try this maybe. Try going for a flavoured tea. So if you're used to having sort of English tea with milk, obviously milk we want to cut down on. Milk has lactose, lactose is a sugar. So maybe change your tea from regular English tea to maybe a flavoured tea and you might find that there's no need to have sugar in those at all. It's a bit like when people are trying to stop smoking. If you still keep putting even sweetenings in and artificial sweeteners, even stevia to a certain extent, you never change your taste buds. And we'll hear from uh, Nina Teicholz later in the week. And Nina says, it really is amazing how quick your taste buds can change. That first week without sugar, yes, things don't taste the same, but literally your taste buds within seven to 14 days will change completely off the scale. And what you used to like changes dramatically. I used to, like everybody else, love bread. I virtually vomit if I have bread now. Here's an interesting thing. If you want to know how quickly bread turns into sugar inside the body, take a little cube, put it in your mouth, and don't swallow it, and chew and chew and chew. And within a minute, you'll realize it is so sweet, your body can't cope with it. And here's another frightening thing. Dr. James Gornick teaches us that, should, that the bread is probably responsible for more dental work in children than any, even the fizzy pops. Bread. Did you know that the number one admission before COVID into hospital for five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, and nine-year-olds in Great Britain. The number one reason they get admitted into hospital, dental work, real problems with teeth. Uh, and that is caused by sugar, as we know, but also bread. Bread turns into sugar so quickly by the enzymes in the mouth, it's sugar before it even gets down the throat. Uh, right. Um, 
Um, we reckon, uh, Primal Living says, we recommend slowly cutting out sugary food from your diet every day. Have you tried green tea, uh, other alternatives, or perhaps uh, you look elsewhere in your diet where you can keep cutting back. So, our I'm final... Dying to know the answer. Say again? I'm dying to know the answer to the big back question. Jack wants <laughs> to know the answer. Okay, and what is it? It is 11 o'clock, so let's wrap up today's show. Uh, the answer to how much sugar cubes, the equipment... Let me explain what this means. This is the effect that the bread on McDonald's ha and other burgers, it's not just singling out McDonald's, it's all about the gram weight of bread. The gram weight of bread in a McDonald's once you've taken it in, once it's gone past your teeth, turns into the same effect on the glucose level, that's the sugar in our blood, as eating six cubes of sugar. It's almost as bad as eating, you ready, or drinking a can of Coca-Cola. That's just the bread. So when you have your barbecues right now at home, uh, as you're self-isolating the garden, as the summer gets nice, don't put bread on your burger. Think of something else. Maybe sandwich it with lettuce. Maybe make some bread out of something other than flour. Maybe make your own almond bread or your coconut bread. Uh, or just think of different... Or, or once you, <laughs> to be honest, when you don't like bread like me and you hate bread because of all the, what it does to you, um, there are so many better ways to enjoy your food. That's it from us down in the health bunker today. Um, Please do tell all your friends about this. We saw some uh, slightly bigger viewing figures than yesterday, so thank you very much. Keep your donations going uh, on the Just Giving page. Uh, just type in the Food Bank Show. Together we're trying to raise as much money and awareness as we can for the food banks. But more importantly, well not more importantly, but as important, we're trying to help you change your eating habits at this time while we're all at home. We have to change our eating habits anyway. Let's learn about food together and let's make sure we bolster our immune system to stay as healthy and as safe as possible.